conference uh, preliminaries. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me back when, for uh, family reasons, I had to cancel last year. Um, I'd like to say that this is an updated version of the lecture I would have given, not exactly the same one, because things do move on. I'm aware also that uh, only one of the five points I'm talking about technically comes within the title of the conference. Um, on the other hand, I have a perfect excuse, because almost all of the monuments have features in common with a group that ought to be the first to find as the Tayside uh, Stone Circle. And though some of my individual examples aren't within his, uh, his definition or his distribution, I think they're essentially the same thing. I'm going to talk about five sites, but for the purposes of today, I'm going to focus to quite an extent on the one that is in your area, um, and I'm still unfortunately whether it's called Crop or Aid or Crop or Out. I've been told both even in the course of this morning, I can probably slip between the two. Uh, the landowner of India calls it Crop or Aid, um, but he's English. Now, what I'm talking about is essentially a sequel to the, the, the project which was. Uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, I've been looking at stone circles in different parts of Scotland uh, for about 20 years, but the early part of that work uh, is now complete and, uh, and published and then for the most part already out of print. So I'm not going to try and uh, summarise what is already available, and in any case, what I have to say either updates or corrects what has been published, but I think that's probably of more general interest. So originally, I began work on Clara Cairns, then looked at Aberdeenshire of the Common Stone Circles, and then looked at Henge Monuments. The one on the right, the Middle Cricket, um, supposedly enclosed a stone circle, though I'm afraid by the end of the excavation it became clear the circle wasn't actually a circle, but it didn't really matter. What all these projects did was generate some unfinished business, that there were issues that couldn't be addressed and needed addressing. And what I'm talking about now is essentially an update. The most recent stone circle project was on the recumbent stone circles. It's pleasing that Great Crowns of Stone, the very fine publication by Adam Weldon and Strat Halliday, uh, features the two sites we excavated on the front and back covers, respectively. Uh, Puppy Mill Wood, Puppy Mill Wood, and Aiky Bray. I want just to summarise very briefly where we're coming from, because I didn't expect everybody to have had the melancholy experience of sitting there trying to read the three volumes of excavation reports to prepare themselves. Carver, climate cairns are essentially mean cairns or passage graves surrounded by stone circles, and um, though they frequently be compared with Irish tombs of the Neolithic, they are not Neolithic, they're early bronze age. Recumbent stone circles here represented by Tom Maviri and Tarland on the east side. Essentially the same date, but this time lower cairns. This is really a platform cairn rather than green cairn. It's not hollow in the centre, so it was the hill out crops there. It couldn't be. And again, surrounded by a stone circle. The major feature of both is that the stones are graded by height, and the major focal point is towards the south of the southwest. When we worked on both sides, we were surprised, in fact, rather naive, because uh, on the covered stone circles, we had exactly the same surprise as we had with the plant cairns. We were ambushed by the archaeology not once but twice over. Because it was the orthodoxy, either that these monuments were unitary constructions, the stone circles and the internal cairns were contemporary with each other, or that the cairns were built inside an already open, permeable monument of the stone circles. Well, I'm afraid the stratigraphic evidence of these sites showed that we've got it completely the wrong way round. And that the stone circle was effectively a secondary development and to some extent the last development on these sites. It was closing as well as enclosing those monuments. And work at Rumen Creek suggests the same may be true of the earthworks of at least some hinges, certainly that one. So in, in the upper half of this diagram, at Clara, the passage grave is surrounded by a rubble platform which partly blocks the entrance, not completely, and that platform provides foundation for the stone circle, and the bottom Tom the Deer, a circular cairn is repeated on the outside by a rubble buttress, and that rubble buttress itself provides the foundation for the stone circle. And it's at that stage that it's modified, and two very tall stones, the flankers, and a large flat stone, the recumbent stone, are placed between them, facing southwest. Now, I'm bringing that story up to date in a sense with five monuments. Lickenbury, which is south of Nairn, Took, which is at King Tor, 
Walkmill and Hillhead, which are the two next door neighbours of Tom Neveri, and Crocmoreg or Crocmorab, uh, which is close to the east end of the block town. In a way, this is the monument that should not appear in this lecture, or should not have appeared in this lecture. Uh, it was excavated uh, for Aberdeenshire Council two years ago, damaged by forestry, and believed to be a large Roman Iron Age roundhouse. And later in this talk, you'll see why I wanted to excavate a large late Iron Age Roman, sorry, a large Roman Iron Age roundhouse. I still do. Because this turned out, just when I thought we'd close the books on stone circles, there'd be another one. Um, this is a site called Hillhead. Um, it has escaped notice completely because it's higher than all but one recumbent stone circles in Scotland. And yet, um, a local resident can remember it when it even had the standing stones in the 1940s because she used to play among these girls. And our brief was essentially to characterise the monument, to date it, and to advise on whether it should be preserved, which at least is no longer in the trees have been removed. So this is essentially a sampling exercise on the monument which we had no inkling existed. When it was first observed, it was observed as a large roundhouse. And so it, so it seemed until we had a site meeting. We had to wait four months for the snow to clear. We found that it was covered by 13,000 pieces of flaked quartz, which was worrying. And that the wall, the house wall, was made of grounded boulders, which was also worrying. When we actually excavated, it became more worrying still. There's not a lot of the monument left, as you can see. Uh, it has had two generations of forestry. This is the second one, forestry plough, the gone through it, and just leaving one tree for puzzles. But on clearing, it became clear. It became obvious this was a substantial cairn with a spectacular view eastwards, southwards, and in the direct general direction of Northern and in the far distance of Nagar. Masses of rubble and traces of the curb. It had been damaged, but nothing like as badly damaged as we thought. And strangely enough, after all the time I'd spent trying to date these monuments, it is the site that has more radiocarbon dates than any other, and more accurate ones. A number of features um, became apparent. On the southwest side, there were voids where quite recently large vertical stones had been removed. This one partly masked by a large block of a type of rock that does not occur locally, uh, which may or may not be the remains of a recumbent stone. Now, this is going to do a point here as well, let's see how it goes. Uh, those. <laughs> those. <laughs> my thumb is too big for this. Uh, I'll, I'll describe those point, The points that you keep seeing are just. Consists of the hollow left by the recumbent and the hollows left by the two vertical stones. Directly opposite the on top right, and I won't even attempt to the point again, there is a fallen monolith from its socket. It's a massive circular enclosure with an entrance. The entrance is probably original and it has two phases of ring cam. The details don't really matter. It starts as a rubber wall and then an outer screen is added on the outside and the, sur the top of the surface is step. So it goes down as you look down into the interior, rather like an amphitheater. Now, it has a number of features in common with the sequence I've already described. It's larger than the sites at Clara or at Tom Neveri, but the stones seem to focus towards the southwest, where there is the imprint of a large flat stone, the hollow is left by two flanking stones. There is a ring cairn with an inner and an outer curve, built, I may say, in exactly the same manner. In the case of outer curves from the bearing, the inner curve is top copy of your wood. And I'll show you secondary features inside it uh, in a minute. It also is aligned on not regard the very same mountain as from the bearing. But I want, at this point, to, to move away from the sequence at, at Hill Head, simply because that is essentially an addition to the pattern that we've already seen. Though it is more of the same story, although it has good dating evidence suggesting that the monument is early Bronze Age and dates from between 2200 and 2000 BC, pretty much the same date as Tom Neveri, and the date one can infer from the pottery or scattered carbon dates in much older excavations. But what happened next? Well, for Aubrey Burl, the leading authority on stone circles in Britain, Stone circles become smaller, have fewer stones, tend to be slightly oval. 
And clearly a candidate is Prop Moreni, which we see here. It's complicated by the fact that there are two concentric or approximately concentric stone settings here rather than one. And it's made much more complicated by the fact that this built on top of a glacial mound, which itself has been modified, it has been sculpted. It overlooks the con or is beside the confluence of the Tay and the Lion. It doesn't overlook it at as I started to say, because there's a little dead ground in between. And it is towards the east end of Octa. It is one of a series of small stone circles of this type. There are two above the shore of Octa and the final one at the west end of Kim. This is the only one that's seen excavation. And it was excavated to a very high standard indeed by Stuart Pickett and Derek Simpson in 1965 and published in 1971. The only reason that fresh work has happened there is those dates are too early for the radiocarbon data with small samples. And in the excavation report, Pivot and Simpson record that the charcoal was too small for data, wasn't collected. Our excavation is not really, or not initially, of a stone circle. It was an excavation there put by box from the 1965 excavation. Anything additional was unexpected. Well, here you see on the left um, a picture of the 1965 excavation. Uh, carried out as they need or were on a Weaver, uh, Mortimer Wheeler uh, square manhole principle with foot wide bulks. And on the right, uh, the very tiny trenches that we excavated in 2012. They were, of course, not intended to reopen the earlier excavation, but to find the unexploded bulks in between those trenches to sample them um, for charcoal. Most particularly, where Charcoal was recorded in an unpublished pencil plan by Stuart Pigot, which is in the National Monument record. And, and that to say, uh, that was successful. Of course, there were other reasons um, for wanting to go back there, most particularly the being that the original excavator did not necessarily have the right sequence to the site. On the left, you have the Stuart Pigot's plan for the site. Now, just uh, refer to a number of components. There is an outer stone circle with two portal stones on the northeast. Inside it, there is an oval standing stone, which is itself cut through a shallow ditch and associated with a partial ring of post tunnels. And at the centre, there is a natural stone, and on the outer edge, there is a, what was described as a rubble bank, which was in fact a wall, but it was not sectioned in 1965. The problem was dating. Very simply, Pickett and Simpson uh, as one would expect for their generation, reached for parallels with southern England and Wessex, where timber circles were thought to be invariably earlier than stone circles. Therefore, the post hole setting and in shallow ditch must be earlier than the oval setting with monoliths, which was cut into the filling of that ditch. It then followed that the outer circle must be later, and then it suggested that two empty pits by the portal stones could have taken inhumations which wouldn't have survived in the acid soil. They made it perfectly clear this was merely their preferred hypothesis. The only stratigraphic evidence is that the stone oval was later than the oval post setting. The rest is hypothetical and basically borrowed from places like Stonehenge. And I think in any that has happened in the last 40 years, it's a realization that Scottish prehistory can't be written by extrapolating prehistory of southern England. Give just one example, remember the Britain. The henge and the stone setting, the circle that's setting, were earlier than the timber circle outside the mess entirely based on radio carbon data. Okay, let's find technology. The central feature of that excavation is the cubia. It's a large glacial erratic naturally embedded in top of the equally natural glacial mound. And yet it was clear in 1965 that people in the past had dug around it to try and work out what it was doing. And the excavation in 1965 followed suit. It's clear too that fires had in prehistory been lived against this stone. However, once it was recognised that it was a feature of the geology of, of, the, of the local area, it disappears in the excavation of what's described as some kind of fireplace, and nothing more said about it. A few other details. Here is the outer bank, and so forth. Um, at two points, on the right, it's essentially set in a shallow ledge in the edge of the mound. On the left, it covers, it runs across level ground, and consists of huge blocks which have been leveled into position with rubble underneath them. It was never investigated. And um, on top, top left, uh, this is one of Stuart Pickett's photos that demonstrate that the empty pits could indeed hold a 
typical Edinburgh student. Um, <laughs> curiously enough, um, I gave this talk in Edinburgh, and the typical student has been identified by now a distinguished professor. And I'm, far too, <laughs> I'm far too shy to, to make contact with the town. I've got a photograph of you <laughs> when you were much, much younger. Now, one reason why uh, the excavator sequence was accepted, and I don't want to go into a lot of technical detail, was the assumption that there was a, a, a detailed stratigraphy in the site, that the glacial mound was the old land surface, onto which, um, into which a stone surface had been set, that it was enlarged, increased by adding the soil, built up as an artificial layer, and then the stone sockets for the inner end were cut from there. Um, that explained why, in the site records, the packing stones are halfway up the soil profile. But I'm afraid it isn't true. Um, that is the Bronze Age ground surface, and the excavator dug straight through the old land surface, which was invisible, invisible to them, invisible to me. Well worn, but it's not at all surprising. And the reference to the site the project files shows why any of the students weren't fast enough, they had only three weeks, and they employed workmen in the Sterling Castle. You can see them in their home rooms in the site photos, and they went straight through to the solid clay where features could be recognised. And one indication was the only cremated bone from the whole project comes out of backfill and is like bronze age. There's the car. Sorry, I keep detaching myself from other pieces of machinery. Now, there's another thing that you can learn from the site archive. It did show not only the stones that are standing in section when they're happy, but also, of course, the stones that are uh, formed. Now, there's been some wonderful city literature talking about the gradient of the stone circle of rock or end, but the stones in the southwest are, as usual, higher than the others. Well, of course they are, because they fall, and you can measure the entire length, whereas the ones that are sitting around, we don't know that high they are. But actually, it was right, because you can scale them off the photographs of the excavation. In fact, the stone circle was graded to the southwest, and indeed there's some grading on the inner oval, which is here shown in, in yellow. So we can see some of the trains that come from the sites that are already been excavated, carrying on. But carrying on when? One of the crucial elements was what was the sequence, what was the date? Well, we attempted to resolve that with very small scale excavation. Um, I won't try to use the pointer, but this is me. That is the pulp between two of the 1965 trenches. And that is essentially what we were looking for, and we were looking for essentially to take charcoal from it. Number one is the foundation for the wall, which had never been sectioned, and we looked at that as well. And uh, I think I've just, I've just done the same to you, though, but I'm not sure how. <laughs> Under the foundation of the wall, there were quantities of charcoal. The charcoal at the centre feature disappeared. Um, the hollow for the, the post setting contained pottery in 1965 with recovered charcoal. And the archive showed a pit in um, trench four. Um, with hot charcoal under the wall. And they were able to locate those and to obtain radiocarbon dates and uh, 12 of them. So I think we, 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 can, we can believe them, thanks to what used to be historic stuff in the funding yet. Now, in, as I said, in 1965, that is one, it was assumed by analogy that the timber structure must be the oldest, the stone structure that we placed on the footprint must come next, and Finally, the big stone circle with portal stones and putative barriers. The only dating evidence was a very dodgy argument, sort of the evidence, that not only were the empty pits graves, but we know what sort of graves because they had nothing in them and it must be only Bronze Age. Uh, you have to have a law degree to get away with that sort of argument, <laughs> the better one than the one I had. I think now we can see that that's probably wrong, that the outer stone circle is the primary feature, though we still have no direct dating that the timber circle is quite clearly uh, dated to the Middle Bronze Age, and that the stone wall is concentric, precisely concentric, with the inner setting of oval and not concentric with the outer circle, and that that is also Middle Bronze Age, leaving a little secondary activity in the late Bronze Age, represented by the orphan piece of created bone. Well, that's all very well, and it actually reinforces pretty much what Aubrey Bell said many years ago, uh, that small, slightly oval graded stone circles are really among the latest. What is interesting to me are those elements that wouldn't have been in the archaeology of the mid 1960s. That is to say, the surrounding landscape, and particularly the relationship between the cultural wonder, the building, 
and natural events, the natural surroundings of that monument. And I'm delighted George, George Curry is here because some of what I'm going to share was originally suggested by conversation with him. He got there first, as so often. I think I've done two at once. No. Yes. Um, one of the features of what I call Crockham Road is that it has a limited view except in one direction, where it is totally dominated by the summit of Shihan. Uh, you can see that through the trees in winter, the youth question of was it too forested is irrelevant. With the snow on Shihan, you can see it straight through the trees. You can see it equally by moving very slightly up here. That is, of course, a completely natural relationship, but it's a striking one. Second feature is the central stone, the erratic, that was written off as geology of the bottom, as was the natural man. It is a spectacular stone. It's deeply banded, it's very impressive, it's covered when moist, and in the past people have removed souvenirs from it. And I can tell you, having talked to geologists, it is exactly difficult to get even the smallest chip of it. It is a very, very hard rock. And there is no erratic in the neighbourhood, which anyone knows of, nor on the shore of Loch Tay, which has the same composition. It's right on the centre of the mound, and it was exposed in its surface when the archaeological sequence on the site fell down. Now, this is a coincidence that from that natural feature and her natural mound, another natural event is visible. And this is the midsummer sunset as the sun moves into the flank of Chihani, so that the mountain itself lights up. Like, like an active volcano. And the entire sequence of structures at Rockmore is precisely symmetrical with that spectacular stone on the summit of that mound. And the grading of the stone circle is even enhanced by the sculpting of the mound, so that instead of being roughly rounded at the top, it is graded in the same way. It rises up so that uh, what, what, what the television producers call you have a reveal. As you walk into the monument, you go upslope to the point where you see that view. I think that uh, it is very striking, but it, is, it would have been unthinkable in the 1960s when excavation on monuments was designed to distinguish what was done by people from what was done by nature, forgetting that that distinction only becomes part of European philosophy about two to three hundred years ago. So the very first thing is a natural monument, if you like, a natural mound with a spectacular, very odd rock on the surface with a spectacular view. It is then enclosed by the outer circle. We don't know where the bottom stones come, really. It's, it then has within it a timber structure, which I shall return to, but it's essentially in the form of a roundhouse, that round with a porch. That roundhouse, in turn, is replaced by a stone setting, concentric with a wall, which provides a second access to the site towards the southwest. Now, I haven't observed this, this is done by Google Earth, but uh, George has advised me on this. Essentially, that second axis also is relevant to the setting sun at midwinter. So, we have a monument which grows out of a chance observation of the relationship between natural things. And we don't know when, though there is some early Neolithic pottery, all from shirts of it from the site, which have no bearing on the rest of the, of the sequence. What else was going on at this time? Well, Here's um, a monument we were fascinated by at the time of Brunetta Brickley, but didn't work on until later. They came a tour at, at uh, in Tor, uh, died and very nearly destroyed by Charles Elkins from Nauru in 1855. This is a reconstructed plan. Um, he did plan the stone circle of the scale of one. Um, he failed to see the earthwork. The earthwork was first recognised by its own. Keep touching that. Yeah. Um, so the other was partly courtesy of Kira, by which point all the stones have gone, and since then a field wall has been cut across it. Nonetheless, it's interesting because it's another small oval stone circle, which we don't know about grading by height, but in orientation is facing southwest. In fact, it faces southwest across a stream onto the flank of a long cairn, mid middle long cairn. I'm particularly interested because it's also surrounded by an earthwork which has the attributes to hinge monuments I've been looking at in the area. And it's not far from Grenada Creek. Dara will found a series of cremations, um, and some of the pots survive. There's no excavation for it. Our excavation was handled by the fact that it's in a wood among growing trees, and again, it was essential to characterize the monument in dead to dead, not to do more, and to try to rescue some information from the mess that happened in 1855 and subsequently. As you can see, we had limited areas to work with. 
Between 1855 and, uh, and in the 20th century, all the stones have been broken up by sledgehammers. Uh, there were a ton of granite flakes, and they're just stumped. Also, about 50 centimetres of the interior being dug out by Darren. But strangely enough, even despite using all that, there were a series of pits, and some of them contained cremations, and those cremations belonged to the latter part of the early Bronze Age, a bit, probably a bit earlier than the internal structure of Moreni, possibly a bit later than the external structure. And the earthwork around it, which I suppose we call the hinge monument, although it's enough to show that the term isn't really the one we should use. And uh, one bit strange, it had its external bank, its internal ditch, it probably had blocked entrance on the southwest, you can't totally prove that. But it was built on ridiculous proportions, and one of the people who dug with this observed that for 20 years he'd been digging hill forts in the area, and that this was bigger than any of them. Um, it is a massive earthwork, um, bank on the outside, supported by a stone curb, and a date which took us completely by surprise is the late Bronze Age. It was built at the time when Granite House settlements were being occupied in the vicinity at King Tor. It is not contemporary with the original stone circle or the Dalians. And in fact, those stones couldn't possibly have been erected without earth that was there. Logistically, you just wouldn't have room for manoeuvre. Uh, it, it is simply not possible to erect a stone circle without space for people to pull and push. So, what's going on? This is a modern monument that seems to have been closed, enclosed, and then closed, but at a late date. Well, probably enough, there was ever evidence for the late reuse of stone circles, or late activity of them, which hasn't really been brought together. At Clara, we had late Bronze Age cremations in secretary level in the disturbed chamber. On the left, um, Lone Head of Daviot, beautifully displayed as a ring gown, but I'm afraid the interior was not the internal court of a ring gown. It's a late Bronze Age pit cut right through it, full of cremations and late Bronze Age pottery. And Tom Leveri. Tom Leveri, almost all the carpet in the centre of late Bronze Age. There's only a little bit of early Bronze Age uh, charcoal, bone, and pottery today, the original use of the site. These places are returned to, nearly all of them, and back to Hill Head. In the centre of Hill Head, and we had what has been been suspected for a long time from antiquarian records. We had an institute of cremation pile. We had two, um, I'm going to try to get No, I'm not going to try to get We had two uh, slab line figures. This is a for people with much smaller funds than me. Um, we had two slab line features, one with charcoal, the left hand one, and completely scorched in situ and containing cremated bone, as you see again in the garden beds. So there is a phase of reuse. And we see that, that hill head, which is on the left, but you also see it with the eye of faith, and in the sense that we haven't re excavated the Gordon Child site of Old Cave, where very similar evidence is found in a very similar position. And then sealing the entire interior of hill head, and sealing cremation fire is a deposit of, if we allow for 50% excavation, 25,000 pieces of smashed quartz. And I stress smashed quartz, not worked quartz. I think possibly two or three might have retouched its dodgy. There were three pieces of three. This is essentially spread over there to create an effect and to close off the interior of the monument. <coughs> and we have the same um, top left hollow shading. There is density of it. It actually increases in density towards the centre of the site. On the right is Bill and Simpson's uh, plan of the density of quartz in their excavation of Brock Moraine. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really make very clear in relation to stones, but it's the same phenomenon. The difficulty is they didn't keep the material. Uh, but the material we found in their box, just a very small amount, is steadily smashed. And to emphasise that, um, two examples from Ben Law's estate, uh, Tom Breck, where uh, cut marks have actually carved into pieces of quartz, and um, the other man said, well, sometimes I excavated in Gallic, um, with quartz veins on a major rock, which has cavalry uh, carvings. Quartz is significant, and I think it's most significant in the middle to late Bronze Age. There are other sites I could quote. But let's move on to the last of the sites we've been directly involved in. And this is excavated by Ronnie Scott um, and surveyed uh, as well. This is a cow field south of Nairn Lake and Bury. And the only feature I want to draw your attention to is number, number one, which is a very strange circular monument which we assumed, he assumed, we all assumed, was going to be a roundhouse. It is not. It's a ring cairn of a sort. Earlier from the clearance, cairns which overlie it. 
and towards the south, it has a focal point of carefully braided stones chosen by their colours. They've got a bit exaggerated in this picture, but essentially these are their colours, facing south. There is an outer curve, but no inner curve. Inside it, nothing. But what is interesting is here are some of those features that I've been talking about, but what's the date? Early Iron Age. Um, there's no way of talking away the dates. I've processed the charcoal myself. Uh, this is the very end of some of those concerns. Uh, people go back to the monument, recreating them, imitating them, up to the beginning of the Iron Age, which is later than we ever imagined. Now, bringing that together, what can we say? Well, we've said that stone circles may be graded to the southwest. We said they may have big stones on the southwest or the south. And um, what else can we say? Well, firstly, we can say that those ideas remained current right down to the end of the Bronze Age, the of the Iron Age, at least on some sides. Secondly, we can talk about the nature of that big flat stone that's on these later sides. It's not just a recumbent stone. It is a blocked entrance. I don't mean it in a literal sense, but the impression we see two small stone, tall stones with a huge block in between is that of a way in or a way out that has been denied. And in general, those tall stones are facing the dark side of the stone, the side where the stone goes down. And in terms of archaeological association, all these monuments, if they provide any evidence of anything, provide evidence of dead people and nothing else. Cremated bone, the primary and the secondary. You can see it in various senses. Um, a Cairnwell South of Aberdeen, the Palisade of Enclosure, replaced, that's painfully, replaced by a ring hair, which the expert himself said had huge stone blocking it as if it was a recovered stone. So this is Middle Bronson. See one of the little um, towns at Kilmartin with an entrance, it's got a stone placed across it. D, sounds of Forby. Late Bronze Age or early Iron Age, the date isn't quite exact, the same thing. An E strong tower, where instead of having an entrance, you've simply got an increase in the scale of the curve stones. It's as if that direction is, has a special significance. And that's again, if I no longer believe there's anything to do with the moon, so please, please, uh, please correct the cover of the book I thought it's out of print this morning, so this morning. Uh, I nicked it with an Italian novel, I shouldn't have. Um, essentially, it's dark side of the sky. And this links very nicely with, for example, folklore in the southwest of Ireland, where the southwest is associated not just with the setting sun, but with the passage of the dead to the underworld, which happens through a cane, um, a, a typical of cane. But then, you see, we have a problem. Having said these monuments increasingly feature the dead, they feature the dark side of the sky, first of all, they conflict, they, they, conflict, they contrast with older monuments, the Olympic monuments which I've not been talking about, which have sunrise alignments, or sunset alignments, but generally sunrise alignments. These are the Olympic log games, for instance. And secondly, there is a small problem which you'll notice I've glossed over so far of what on earth the roundhouse is doing in between two stone faces at Proton Lake. Here you see it in the upper diagram. It's a classic ringage house, and I have to say, the only places where the post holes are missing are where stones are falling so that people couldn't excavate, or where the subsoil had been quarried away. It has a ringage, we have carbon dates from that ringage. It also has a porch. But it was built while the outer circle was still standing. It must have, because it's still standing now. And the roof, most probably, would have reached right down to that outer line of stones, which are, 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 is perfectly concentric. And the porch is strange. It's very plain in sight plan saying it's porch. It's 35 centimetres wide. Uh, it would be very difficult to get in or out, and it would have been pitch dark. It is not an ordinary house. Uh, and the idea that the hollow is created by, by stabling cattle, I'm afraid it doesn't work here. We could just have stone pools, but nothing much more. Um, it is a very strange structure. And of course, after one phase of post replacement, it's, com it's commemorated by a stone setting on exactly the same foot. But what about Strickham? Strickham, um, a recumbent stone circle excavated in the 70s, very recently published, has one or possibly two successive Iron Age roundhouses built inside it. And these are Iron Age, not Middle Bronze they have carbon gates. But again, it's built inside a structure that's already standing. So in the early Iron Age, the reuse of stone circles takes a different form. The buildings in the image of a domestic house are erected inside them. But it's not necessarily true that they are used for domestic purposes. For material from them, they're not comfortable places to be. And it would be absurd 
uh, trying to maintain normal life while bumping into all those monoliths. Well, let's go on one stage further. Um, this was, this I guess was a big accident in our project. One of the issues I wanted to investigate was the similarity of difference between two neighbouring stone surveys. One was Tom Revere, which was uh, excavated quite a long time ago and published. The second was a community project we did in time to find its next door neighbour, which was last seen, except for the stone in 1835, when it was levelled. And all we wish to do is find out its plan. Um, well, the stone which is shot on to is not in the right place. Uh, it's been moved by a whole series of generations of farmers, and I have a nice conversation with the current farmer, who said, how do you get him moved? He said, well, I'm an archaeologist. So I can see it set in the ground inside a tractor. Oh, that's very clever. <laughs> I think you have more interest in that observation, that, that what we did find, it's actually located not very far from a now destroyed settlement site, and from what I call former cemetery, which produced some rather remarkable finds in the 19th century. These. Uh, these are in the literature since 1898 and appear to come from two or three graves, possibly stone lion fists, and in the most of remarkable collection, um, including part of a flagon, an anchor brooch, an iron dagger, gaming pieces, and a silver model cauldron, all, all now in the National Museum. How stupid could I be not to think about those when I was taking 350 metres away? But it seemed the same distance until we started, and we found the other end of the cemetery. Um, the stone circle very easily dealt with. There's not much left. Um, some monoliths traces of the curve, and particularly the rubber trench for the inner court, which is very clear in the central pit. Much more worrying were the big features uh, on the south. And I did a site visit. Um, I feel totally shaped up. This is a very good excavator. and explained that we now found the huge sockets of the recumbent stones and the smashed granite. And this was just what I expected. We'd be gone about 10 minutes. Uh, where, when it became clear there was something wrong, we had another Roman gaming set and another penangular brooch. And it did for copy. It's a Roman Iron Age cemetery and a very extraordinary one. Even allowing for the very fragmentary record of the 19th century, this is unusual. In fact, when I rang Fraser Hunter and said, I think I've done something wrong. Uh, how about, is this unusual? He said, no, it's unique. That was about, that was the moment of truth. 200 kilometers north of the northern Roman frontier, and we've now got, in Africa, a cemetery which contains two Canadian approaches, three Roman gaming sets, and incidentally, two, two cremations of carbon dates. It's only, or they shot past, um, two, spiral, two spiral rings associated with the sky of a cow. Well, that's pretty weird. Uh, that's part of our gaming set. Uh, one is a shale, the other is a natural bowl. It's probably contained in the bag. So we have the paradox of a very, very local form of monument selected for reuse by the local community during the Roman age to the extent that one of the cremations is actually in the dead centre of the stone circle. Not far away, there was the uh, Melbourne settlement of roundhouses or enclosures. And there's not much left of it, and I can't say much about it because uh, it's now a used car cemetery. Um, but I can show you its location, I can try it there, and it just continues to work here are the stones that were the stones of the stone so marked by the yellow bucket. And I'm not going to try again. On the left are the two big graves. And it becomes clear this is not a unique instance. We've now had a number of stone circles that attract specialised attention during the Roman period. And what it seems to me is that native communities are, on the one hand, exchanging ideas and practices, like the practice of gaming, with the Roman world, but at the same time distancing themselves uh, by burying their artifacts, burying their dead, inside the most archaic and most typically local form of monuments, the Cumberland Stone Circle. Where do they live? Well, we're not going to get anywhere with Melbourne. But fortunately, there is another settlement, or two other settlements, not so far away with gigantic Massive Roman round, no, sorry, Roman, that's jumping down, round houses, uh, up to 20 meters in diameter. Uh, this is Old Kinord on D side, um, excavated by Lord Abercrombie in 1903. Uh, the report's quite good, but part way through, he lost his name, couldn't hope the rest in memory. Um, but I'm glad to say, how a week ago, I got permission, generally one in consent, to reopen these trenches 
turn to suzerain, so we can at least check whether perhaps a liquor they meet in special contact with Rome are burying in places like Wartmill and living in places like Dior. Now, this suggestion that in the letter that they pre Roman and Roman languages, people are looking to the past in a conscious way is not actually restricted to the evidence from seven circles. Because in practice, a number of pseudonyms also incorporate cast stones of an earlier date, usually cut mark stones. This evidence is much better known in Anderson Pine, but it does occur on D side, and it may be part of a similar phenomenon at roughly the same time. Uh, not very far from where we're talking about this is the pseudonyms of Kush and Clover at this. Now, we bring you to stone circles. It goes to another archaeological phase again. Um, I know there are difficulties in using the adjective, but shorthand, let's say it's a fictitious period. Um, and here are two examples. What on earth is Clava doing there? Well, when we started excavation at Clava 20 years ago, we were delighted to find a slab setting right outside the central ring cairn with cremated bone underneath it. And was less delighted than in the 7th century AD. And when we excavated at Brumay the Quickly, we had the inconvenience of a transported a pictures of the stone placed in the centre of the monument so that we couldn't reopen the primary burial that he put there to protect it when he was found in quarrying by, again, I'm afraid, Charles Elminster Dunlopper. Now, that's interesting in itself, but the Latin and Shepherd told me that he recognised the pop mark of a square barrow nearby, and in fact, a virtual position where that Dunlopper claimed he obtained the stone. It is tempting for some proof that this had been marking a British bed. And a number of people observed how often simple stones, where there's any good topographic evidence, come from places with an earlier history. One example, I think, is the, the number of Pictish simple stones which occur either on reused standing stones, which are identified by their form, or the fourth stone, or those where they're cut marked, as here I think it's at Dingwall, where clearly the cut marks are much earlier. Needle shows this very well. The very good display there that the designs cut across uh, much older cut mark stones. There is a conscious going back to these places, and uh, your, your, your hoard, of course, is perfect for this. Your, your new hoard, which I, I won't talk about in case you're doing. Uh, there are actually two stone circles with Pictish silver boards. Why? Well, David Clark, of the many David Clarks, this is the end of David Clark, has suggested that. At the time of Christian mission, local communities who resisted being Christianized put a new emphasis on their own past and emphasized that by carving stones they saw themselves as part of their heritage, even though they might have understood it, certainly regarded as antiquities. And it's a very tempting hypothesis. It would, if one accepts the sequence, also explain why over time the images transformed from these enigmatic designs to what are clearly Christian. Well, that, in a sense, is the last archaeological phase of reuse. But there are other phases of reuse, and I'm particularly fond of this one, uh, because we never built it. It's a man called Jameson Schroeder, I've never met him, it's a shame. And it's at Lime Speed, outside being tall. Um, I first discovered this by field work, uh, in the sense I saw it out of the window of our vehicle when we were traveling the excavation book. I must be going mad, there wasn't a stone circle there last year. Uh, no, there wasn't. Um, it was, in fact, um, it was, in fact, the result of a vision um, built out of stones obtained nearby. And the great thing about it is that, in one sense, it is a very accurate copy. In another sense, it's slightly wrong. It's graded, it faces precisely southwest, it plays with the colours of the stones and the textures of the stones. It's just a small problem that it's twice as big as it ought to be. Um, now, I have to say, I have not met Mr. Schroeder, and I may be doing him justice. One of his friends told me that he thought he muddled up the diameter of the radius. <laughs> now, that, that's a charitable explanation. Another is that uh, he had another vision, which is this is a great place for a free festival, and you can hold more people in a bigger circle. And Bruni Stains has become the site of a huge festival. Now, it's perhaps I'm there to tell the story, but I've done it before, and I will this time. If you look this up in the National Database, Canmore, it says that uh, the site was discovered by the then Royal Commission from an airport. Yes, it was, but it was two years after 3,000 people attended the festival. <laughs> um, I think he just said something about the archaeologists. Yeah. But he has everything. Um, 
that labyrinths, which I'm not talking about, Tibetan music, music players, I don't know what the instrument is, played it. But I've got to lost an image. Yes, yes, I thought there was a missing bit. Um, I just, I, we got to the 20th century too fast. Bidmar Kirk, where um, a stone circle was Christianized around 1800, church was moved, they then built a graveyard around the stone circle, rearranging the stones to create a better aesthetic effect. And Clava. Now, this is not one of my students, uh, but Clava has an alternative life, uh, which is which I observe bits of. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen the party of 57 shamans there, and right in the double deck of bus you've been for them. Uh, we, we found sacrificed pigeons um, in the chambers of the boarding. But I didn't meet the belly dancer except on the web. Now, we go back to the new stands. The last thing I want like to make is that these monuments still have reverberations today. I've talked about the new stands very briefly. There are something like six or eight new recumbent stone circles now, for you? This is not a recumbent stone circle. This is a landscape structure. Um, the work of uh, John May, a distinguished doctor, who, who had worked with us very briefly on stone circles. It is a place of origin of Kenya. It is built in the image of the summit of Benahi, and quite deliberately out of the spoil heap for the largest granite quarry in the region. So the tradition still continues. We have their stone circle, we have their mound, we have their in the distance, uh, not in this picture, yes, I think it is actually, but that's my mind. The summit of Benahi, very conscious, uh, and I talked, to, I talked to John, so I mean I'm not reading anything into it. The tradition continues. So we have, when we think about these monuments, not just to think of them in terms of the single phase, not just to think of them as prehistoric and the modern excavation, because in between our activities on their sites and the activities of the people who first conceived them, there are many other attempts to interpretation, transmutation, annexation, exploitation, display. Some of which might have a political context, like the Roman Iron Age use, maybe the, the Pictish use as a resistance to Christian missions. Sometimes it's simply a reversion to the past as a source of authority, an attempt to recreate past notions, as in the late Bronze Age, almost academic reconstruction of the idea of the of stone circle and the addition of cremation values. All these things are happening. So that in a sense, the archaeology I've been talking about over the last 20 years is only the remote stage in the process. And I have a horrible feeling that I hope I won't hear someone soon will be excavating my excavation uh, to find something else that couldn't be done while I was there. Thank you. <laughs>